So yeah, so a little background on, on physical therapy. Those of you listening may not be PTs or uh, may not know exactly what it goes into. So with PT school, the way it works out is you, you're going through your undergrad program and then you, there you have to meet certain prerequisites and requirements to apply for grad school. And so there's a certain amount of classes that you take. Most of it's pretty heavy in chemistry, biochem, physiology, exercise physiology, psychology, et cetera. And then you apply for, uh, for grad school and, and take the GRE and then you get into grad school. And then in grad school is really designed, PT school is really all about a really generalist approach of the human body and starting to look at pathology and movement dysfunctions. We look at the big systems like neuro neurophysiology, cardi cardiology, uh, musculoskeletal, and then we look at the skin or the integumentary system, which is really probably the largest organ in the body, interestingly enough. Uh, but P PTs actually can do some wound care, wound debridement and stuff in a burn unit or some of those environments, which is interesting and quite far from what we do uh, as, as clinicians in, in today's day in sports med. But it's always a part to understand because that, that plays a big role in outcomes. But nonetheless, as you, as you graduate from that program, I think the common finding we have we, you know, as post-students ourselves and students we've talked to and colleagues is no one ever feels prepared leaving physical therapy school to go into the clinic and boom just start treating like everybody i've always talked to always feels like oh, i didn't feel like i learned anything right and i would counter that and say well that's not that's not true at all you learned a ton and you've learned a ton of evaluation skills and a lot of concepts and you've learned kind of how to assess and how to critically think is probably i think the biggest thing you get from school uh, but what you don't get is a ton of experience so one, one thing that that school doesn't give you is as much residency as you might get in some other other fields like like medicine where we do internships and rotations uh, but they're fairly brief so you're looking at maybe six to nine months of total time in the clinic uh, before you come out and usually those are spread out amongst different settings where you're in a hospital setting you're in an outpatient orthopedic setting you might be in a neurological setting or a transitional care environment with a nursing home or something like that so you're really getting this diverse education, which is amazing, and I think actually serves the the serves a purpose. Yeah, it yeah. serves a purpose very very well, which is often overlooked and debatable. But that's a little background on on kind of how you get to the to the point of, of becoming a PT, and then from there it's really like let's now how do how do I master my craft? And mm -hmm. and our craft certainly is sports med and working with folks that are active and wanting to be active and challenging their bodies and in maybe athletic ways or active ways. So we're gonna focus mostly sports medicine musculoskeletal for, for our development and, and for our kind of history, but just to kind of lay the groundwork there of some of, the, some of those options. So there's quite a bit of debate right now in, in our field is do you just go into the clinic and uh, start working for a certain a group? Do you, do you find a mentor and follow that person? Um, do you hire a mentor maybe and have someone be remote uh, that guides you? Or do you do a residency program where you apply for residency and then you you go through this long-term process. Usually it's a year-long process. It's either focused on heavy on orthopedic uh, clinical specialties and, and working with your hands and manual therapy, or it's focused heavily on mm -hmm. sports, uh, which really looks more like athletic training, like being on the field with athletes and uh, preventing injury and dealing with on-the-field injuries more so than truly sports rehab in, in my, my experience. And that one's really tough because our license doesn't really cover that. Yeah. So there's right. kind of like right. a... Bit of a gray area. Yeah, there's a bit of a right. gray area there with that one. I think you leave as a, a really, really good generalist from school, as you should. I mean, I think every new therapist that does feel a bit overwhelmed or they feel like they don't know anything when they walk into the clinic that they finally want to be in and they see maybe very tenured therapists in that facility that are they're being the master, they almost want to judge themselves completely off of, that's my benchmark right now. But in reality, just like they are in the moment, that therapist had tremendous baseline skills at their age at that time and probably felt the same way when maybe they saw a, a future mentor a mentor of theirs so I, I think it's it's critical to put the minds at ease for new therapists to say you have the tools just like you said um, to get the job done and to be very good at being reactive to things that come in that you may feel like you're not prepared for but you own the basics own your anatomy, own your physiology, and understand that because that's going to be the root of how you communicate to someone, whether it's you know the, the simple orthopedic issue or it's that high-level athlete that comes in looking for some expertise. You can serve both those people if you have a strong foundation in, in basics. Um, and then how you fill the gap is, I think, where we want to tailor this conversation. Yes, I met um, Mark Verstegen at, as a 
as a young uh, therapist, I did my first internship at Athletes Performance and worked with Mark, who now runs Exos and, and was the founder there. It's a tremendous training facility. So, it was, but his, uh, I mean, his number one line at the time was do the simple things savagely well. Yes, love it. Mm. And it, and it's you know carried on forever. And, and I t- t- that was you know that was 2004, so you know 16 years ago or so here. And looking at that, and the process that, that Mark laid out as far as how to organize a training program and how to work with somebody is something that, that, that we use today and is kind of the, the foundation of, of how we put programs together from, for a rehab client or for a, a performance training client. And having that structure of knowing how to fill these certain blocks, a very, very simple concept of filling these blocks. And the same thing is true when you come out of school is that you know how to evaluate each of these blocks. And they're, they're, really, they're, really, they're really the same blocks. So it's just a tremendous structure to look at these different, these different segments and just look at starting how do we fill those gaps and then from there progressive, progressive uh, rehabilitation. Well, I mean, I think you look at you know, really what physical therapy is, is we're, we're coaching people. And so we've become this really interesting person in people's lives. We influence them with our hands. We influence them with how we investigate the problem and identify their dysfunction. We have to communicate that and, and put together a, a plan and then really implement it with corrective exercise and and uh, coaching with a with a program and, um, and and create an environment for them to succeed in. And there's so many components that lead to that success that I, I see students come out and they're really not sure about what their limiting factor is as an influencer or as a coach. And you know, I think a lot of people just think, well, I just need to put my hands on a lot of people, or I need to you know do a residency. I just need to see mm-hmm. it done a, a bunch mm-hmm. of times. But really, at, at the end of it, we are interacting with another human. Mm-hmm. And that skill of influence is so critical. And it's really uh, hard to get good at that without actually starting to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why when I'm looking at students that are coming out, or if they're, or if they're in school, if, say they're, um, they're in college and they're thinking about going into grad school, and what can I do now? It's like, that's really simple. Mm-hmm. What sport were you involved with? Start coaching. Yeah. Are you involved with any fitness training? Pick up a few clients. Start influencing people because that skill set is really how you apply the technical aspect of, of biomechanics and pathophysiology and healing and touch. You have to have a, a, a mode, and that's so oftentimes the limiting factor of a student that's been in academia for too long. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, ahead. just um, I, it kind of, as you think about. Uh, from what you said about being the coach or, or um, learning about what you don't do well and, and putting yourself in those environments to improve yourself. I think for, for my own personal experience in first joining, I guess, this company a, a while ago, um, we really recommend every therapist that is with us is to coach at some point, whether it's coach a small class, whether it's coach an entire gym floor, whether it's coach um, a sports team, whatever it may be. But um, one of my more personal uh, growth points was joining the gym side of things as a coach myself. As I know very much about myself, about um, having the, my, my weakest point being uh, engaging with people, like a very strong introvert where I would just kind of like basically observe and probably figure it out from there and not really putting myself out there to to talk to, I don't know, you could call them strangers, I guess, but in a crowd of people, I will not just be the one to talk to everyone. I can absolutely (laughs) promise you that. If I can find a shadow, I'll sit in it all day. Um, But one of the most powerful things that I went through and was joining the gym and being around um, a a very influential coach that we are thankful to be around all the time is uh, Vince Minnie and then Gabe Jackson. And both those guys get deep into people's lives like I've never seen before. And they connect with people in ways that I've never done myself. And I felt like when I was with them, that was like the key piece I needed to have the confidence on the PT side to, to develop relationships while my own skill set with my hands and my exercise progression was developing. Like I learned so much just being in that environment that I know I could not have gotten in any classroom setting, but that I had these like mentors around me to learn how to engage with a more younger crowd um, in an effective way or to engage with an adult that sees me as uh, someone that doesn't have a lot of life experience. And um, for me personally, that I think having a mentor in that way was super powerful. So I didn't piggybacking on what you said about 
And from what you guys are saying, there's there's kind of three buckets to fill here, right? Like there's the communication side of things, which you're saying was your limiting factor that you learned from coaching. There's hands, and then there's like the exercise side of things, progressions and technique and all of that. Mm -hmm. And maybe the limiting factor for each new therapist might be a little different based on their experiences, right? Like some, some people might come in with extremely extroverted, very good at communicating, but maybe their hands are terrible. I think we've had maybe a couple of therapists that came in in, in that realm, right? And so it's, as, as a mentor, then your job is to figure out which bucket needs to be filled and how do you help them fill that? What are the tools to help them do that? I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah so, so powerful. Yeah. yeah. And one, one mentor of mine, uh, Lenny Macrina, shout out Lenny on this. Is that an Instagram somewhere? Yeah. Um, he, he, the one, one thing he said to me that was super powerful for him, his first experience leaving school was, was going down to Birmingham and he said he would treat 30 people a day. Mm-hmm. And it was he just he said he built this incredible bank of watching thirty people move and helping thirty people go through a process every single day, and he did it for I don't know I can't remember how many years a number of years but he said even today he like goes back to those those like huge bank of people and he relies on that experience so to your point sometimes probably experience is the best thing when people go through these residency programs there's very little treatment yeah. it's much more it's more that is more school much more school yeah. than treatment and so. Or that it's individualized, right? Yeah. So you find a mentor that sees those three buckets in yourself, mm-hmm. and they can quickly identify, like, okay, you need development here. Let's spend some time, focus time there. Yeah. And then we'll eventually get to the other stuff if there's little holes. But this is where you need to work on the best to unlock your potential, which I feel like, you, yeah, you don't get in the classroom. You get you get surrounding yourself by, by people who do it at a high level. 